Cool. So I guess not too many people are going to dare to pronounce my last name. It's pronounced Prokhorenko, but I mean, yes, I, I go by Alex or OP, which is more convenient for the majority of people. And I'm going to try to move so this poll doesn't bother you guys a lot. So, <clears throat> so the topic, the topic for that presentation is like, how does the product role change between firms? So before I'll go there, how many of you think this is like a fun thing to discuss? Uh, uh, that is bullshit. Uh, I don't buy it. So, um, you know, the, yeah, so uh, he, he, here's the thing. Uh, I, I'm not a professor. I didn't work in all kinds of firms. I did went into different types of firms, like stretching from uh, like consumer facing smaller startups into like some middle sized businesses that sell B2B and going into the enterprise, which I spent mostly about 10 years recently. But I decided like, let's talk about something that you probably can learn from my experience, but at the same time that can be more interesting to you. So let's talk about the enterprise product management and actually reasons not to ever do that. Right. And if you don't like it, Good. I, I, I did something good. If you still want to go after it, at least you're prepared and uh, equipped with the information that you need to actually be successful there. Make sense? Okay. So again, my name is actually, my first name is Alexander, uh, which is just a weird spelling of Alexander name because of the country which I'm coming from, Ukraine. I'm a director of product management uh, in Zora. And I don't know if you know much about Zora. We just recently went IPO, uh, second IPO of mine, which I mean, which I think I'm officially an IPO chaser now. So <clears throat> I focus on Zora platform, core platform, pricing and rating. And if we will think about Zora, Zora offers a, a SaaS products uh, to manage your subscription based uh, memberships and products and services for the larger companies. Think GM, think S&P, think 24-hour uh, fitness. So this is all type of customers that would use Zora for all the life cycle of subscription management, starting from uh, quoting, pricing, ending with the revenue. So there are lots of phases, lots of different customers, lots of different users all the way through the process. And um, so, and obviously I cannot own all of that. I focus only on the specific part, which is platform and pricing and rating. I want to make this uh, presentation actually less of presentation. If you have any questions, feel free to interrupt at any time, like challenge me, um, like just ask for clarification. More than happy to do that. Uh, as I said, I'm not a professional lecturer and neither I want to be one. So um, some history. Uh, I am an engineer by trade. I've been do doing hands-on engineering for quite a bit of time. Uh, uh, Ruby, Java, PHP, all the fun stuff. I actually came from background, what is called DevOps nowadays. I don't know how many of you are actually engineers, but most of you probably heard that. I was doing some system engineering. I, I started building companies, first in telecom business, a second in, in B2C. Um, eventually moved due to my engineering career into B2B um, product management. Was again hyped by B2C product management when I started my second company in the social profile space, which pretty much everybody wanted to do back in 2007. Um, now in enterprise product management, actually right there by accident and uh, killing my entrepreneurial bug by investing. Um, I call it non-professional angel investor. So when I thought, when I was an engineer, most people think I was doing something like that. And when I moved to product management, I actually ended up doing just that. So there is not a much difference, except the, I guess the face is a little different and I have to wear a shirt nowadays. Cool, so one thing to remember, these are only my own thoughts. I'm just sharing with you don't take them seriously. Do your own due diligence. Uh, I have my own experience, you have yours. There are lots of factors that can influence what I have seen and what you're gonna see. 
in, in, in the product management. So please be aware. And again, this is not something that my company may share. In fact, I, I, I would say some of the companies may strongly disagree with some statements I'm going to make. So remember that. So, a couple of words. How many of you coming from engineering? One, two, three, four, five, five about half. Um, and others, where are you coming from? Marketing. Marketing? Analytics. Analytics. Yes, you can call it kind of math stuff, right? Yeah. You guys? Marketing. Marketing. Nice. Marketing people are also good. Yeah. Also valid. Okay. So, how do you think you can break in into the product management? So, from my experience, like three major directions. One, aside from MBA path, right, which is kind of obvious, you get your MBA, you go in turn working for some uh, company as a product manager, lots of opportunities there, aside from any other job, frankly. So first is you're a subject domain expert. You have knowledge in some area that nobody knows better than you. And everybody is willing to get you as a product manager because they think you know how to do it well. Second is you take ownership over the end customer facing assets. What does it mean is you, you go into the last mile. It's not really a specific domain area, but it's something that can be managed successfully if you apply a typical product management rules. There are some frameworks how I approach problems. There are some ways how you do it. Some companies more like user experience oriented. If you've got the ground in design, you can probably do it just fine. Some others are more like uh, analytics oriented. Somebody will say, Okay, here's Google, Google Analytics or some, some like uh, big data thrown on you and like, pr please make decisions. And you do number crunching, you come, come up with a decision and everybody is happy. Or you go into very technical inbound role. What, is, what does it mean is you actually work with engineers very closely. It's, it's like, it's almost as close as the engineering lead or engineering manager, except that you are interface of the, uh, with the field with the field, with the product decisions, and your own prioritization. That's actually the last two things are mine. So uh, I came in as first with a technical background. Um, I worked very closely with engineering. And the other thing is actually because of my B2C experience and lots of experience in the actual front-end facing web assets, I, I this is how I ended up doing product management. So. Um, Product roles differences, right? So before we'll go there, what is enterprise product management? How many different product management around? So in my theory or in my experience, there are three. So one, as I mentioned, is consumer-based product management where the product is targeted consumer-based. Uh, the other one is more like B2B. And what does it mean is your product is facing business customers. However, however your customers can be like small businesses, mid-sized businesses, or you're just improving some, uh, some business process. And then there is an enterprise product management. What is enterprise product management? When you're going after the big enterprises. Big enterprises, I'm talking like 5,000 people and more, at least. So they have lots of business processes that help their businesses to run, and you improve those processes. Uh, often, it's complicated. Often you have a lot of different personas who use your product and the people who buy your product are very different. So that's, that's, um, and there are many other aspects to it as well from the field perspective, as well from the marketing perspective. Some of you probably know this as well. So, um, I will focus on actually differences of enterprise product management because this is what I've been doing for the last 10 years. Make sense? Any questions so far? Okay. Cool. Very first one, inbound and outbound. In the typical enterprise company, it's very common to see inbound product management and outbound product management. What does it mean? Inbound product management is often called TPM, technical product manager, or just the product manager or product owner. This is the person who actually works with the engineering and serves to engineering organization to actually keep them, keep them happy. So things include like, what is the impact on the product, right? What is the quality? How you do this? What is the usability? It's very tactical work that, that make, make, makes you um, 
you, you need to follow different rules in the way how you execute and how you work with the with your engineers or with the, your organization that you work. Then how do you support? What is end of life? How you actually kill products? How you start new products? How you deliver them? What does it mean we, we're launching new product? I get it, the marketing aspect of it, but technically from your end, what does it mean how you deliver it? Um, uh, what is the backlog, right? You own the backlog. There are hell a lot of things over there. How do you manage it? How you prioritize it? How you decide what to work on right now? Dependencies management, as well as team velocity. How quickly can you deliver something? Because every single day, uh, I'm telling you, every single day, somebody will come to you and say, like, how quickly you can give it to me? And like, you have no idea because you're not an engineer, because you're not coding it. So you need to understand the process, the workflow, how you take the idea, how you take a request, convert it into something tangible that uh, engineering can work on and actually come up with a number. And it can be a rule of thumb. I can give it to you in, in one month or I can never give it to you. So it, it depends on like your style, right? Outbound. Most commonly, those are product marketing managers. Sometimes they call a real product manager. That's I heard also. Sometimes they call uh, just a product manager with the outbound uh, um, focus. So this includes marketing, mar market research, includes positioning, packaging, how you price it. Enterprise product management is very, very heavy on pricing, how you package, how you price, because your deal cycle can be like, can take up to a year, maybe two years. So like if you underprice it, or overprice it, it's a deal breaker. Underprice it, you're actually losing money on that. That's very important. This is very dangerous. And like based on like all the effort that you need to put into actually pushing the product down to the customer, you cannot make a mistake over there. So there should be a person who dedicates all the efforts, all his time to make it happen. Right? Uh, revenue, that's shady area. So with the revenue, sometimes Companies try to have a business leader like a GM or somebody like that on the top of product management organization who will basically own the PNL, or sometimes it's given to outbound product manager. I, I have seen both of that. Field enablement. When you build a new product, how field can sell it? Will they even sell it? How they can demo it? How they they how they can like uh, enable the trial? How they can let customers play with it? And whom do they complain when customers don't like it, right? And the analysts, analyst relationship. We're going to talk about this in a, in a bit, but outbound product managers are actually spending huge amount of time working with the analysts. Any questions so far about that? Good. Number two, product agility. Everybody is about agile process, right? So like agile process where agile developers like Kanbans, Scrums, whatnot. We do this all the time. So enterprise product management, it's expensive to release. Every release becomes a nightmare for a lot of people who are involved into it. Uh, a good friend of mine works for the um, Macy's.com, for example. Every time they are releasing, making a, some insignificant push to the servers, it takes him almost 24 hours a shift to actually uh, project manage all this process. So this is very expensive. There is a lot of tax for the enterprise products on that, and it's the 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 the, the cost of mistake is very high. Um, the multi-step adoption you can't just release it. There is some business processes. Then you need to go through integrations. If integrations, there might be migration. There is enablement, compliance, and whatnot. You need to put your check next to every single thing. Uh, otherwise, it's not gonna fly, you, it will not be approved. A long time to kill. This has been an, traditionally a nightmare in my experience in enterprise software. When you release something, you will always have at least 10% of your customer base who will be using the very first version of your software or, or your product. Either it's on-prem or it's cloud. There is always going to be somebody who is fat enough so you don't just come and say like, no, that's your problem anymore because it's not. Uh, and you cannot kill. How do you do this? How you create a process for that? This is your job as a product manager to make a proposal and actually communicate it all the way down to the bottom. Make sense? Cool. 
productization versus customization. That's my pet peeve. So, enterprise businesses, they are, they, all of them, all of that I have seen, all I have talked about, they have professional services, global services, any services organization. Is it good or bad? We can talk about this offline, but it's a necessary evil. You, you have to have it, but do you really, does it contribute a lot to the product? Does it really contribute a lot to the bottom line of organization success? There are lots of examples why it's actually hurting it rather than helping. The problem is that professional services are about customization. This is their job. The problem with the excess customization, it's a burnout, right? The more you customize it, you may end up having your product logo on the customer website, but they actually have their own version of your product built somewhere else. Uh, and the culture. It's very damaging. If you go after customization versus productization, and the reasons could be many, either like dysfunctional product org or inability to communicate, inability to enable field. It's, it's, there are many of problems like that. But if your global services are given green light to do any customization they want, it's, 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 it's going to end up very well. And the culture is going to be very hard to get rid of. Because at the end, they are in the front line, they own their own PL, and uh, they are compensated. Their motivation is based on how much money they make. Yep. In your experience, has that really been a separate part of your organization? Uh, both the engineering product, or have you been of the same umbrella, or what? Yeah, in, in, in my experience, it is always part of the field, and is always part of it, becomes its own org. So definitely product and engineering being as isolated as they can be from that org, which is done intentionally. You want them to be your customer. You don't want them to be your part of your org. However, at the same time, depends how leadership works, all the way through the requests coming from global services down to the product, that's another question, right? So if, they, they, if they're able to escalate any single request of them, of theirs, into the product and basically say, because services want it, you have to do it, otherwise the deal is not gonna happen. That, that's basically your, they are not your customer. They're, they're your management that tells you what to do. So, and the, the typical problems like, like professional, go, uh, professional services goals, like, yeah, make it rain, right? So like, I mean, they get paid for every single hour how this deal is structured, you can like bill a customer like 500K in professional services and then discount it like 70%, right? Because it's like, it's fake numbers at the end. Uh, but they are compensated for that. So the way how discount work is a total different story. Again, not their problem. Uh, with a product, is like you deal with the product obstacles. You don't look at the single use case. You look at the number of use cases. You try to abstract them. You try to satisfy as many potential s solutions as, uh, or requirements as possible. Product service, uh, global services will not care about that. They have a customer. They need to make, make it happen. Cool. Number four, limited access to the front line. So enterprise product management. You are selling to one customer. Somebody else is sponsoring that purchase in, in some different organization. The user is different. The champion is other person who is most likely a manager, barely uses your product, but likes it. And then you have a person who will be asked, how do you like your product, who will actually influence your NPS. Uh, all these different people, not always connected or not always motivated by the same thing. So because you penetrate so many different accounts, like you don't really have a single person to focus on. That's one part. And second part, you as PM in the big enterprise org often shielded from the end customer. You have account manager, relationship manager, communication manager who stands between you and the different groups of end customers, especially when it's related to any financial aspect of the purchase, because so many people can be concerned in your organization that you say something that customer that actually was sold differently to the customer. You don't even know what field people say to the customer when they purchase your product. They sell it can do like X and you can actually can do any of that. So, um, 
So you will get the message converted and transferred through different people and it will be biased. Biased by the people, by the message that actually filled or all these tra uh, tra transitioning people want to deliver to you. Uh, you should be really aware about that and if you can get access to the uh, exact person, just go and talk to the actual customer. Uh, you can always master the way how you can uh, you know, master your sales pitch and every time somebody is asking for you for something, you just revert the question and say like, let me ask you something else or let me like, you know, like, uh, let me come back with you, great question, all this standard like sales stuff, right? Um, but you want to talk to actual customer because only they use your product, only they know how to make it better and what they don't like about it. You're building product, but you're selling the vision. This is more, this is very common in the enterprise space. Um, enterprise problems are not like extremely hard. They are time consuming, they effort consuming, but they're not like rocket science. Nobody building another like, you know, like rocket to the Mars in the enterprise. What they need, they need supply chain problems, they need something else to keep their business up and running, make it more effective. But this is again, not a rocket science. So what is happening is you focus on how to build the best product ever, which takes more time of you than thinking about what you're actually building, because you think you know what you're building. The problem is you build a great technology, but at the end, your competitor goes in, have mediocre technology, but they sell the vision. They sell the customer ability to fly to the Mars with this bicycle that you can actually rent for $1 an hour or something like that. And they say, this is actually the best practice. We know everything about flying to Mars. This is how you should do it. Nobody cares about your technology. And this is what, what field will sell. This is what sticks to get the most of market share. And you're going to end up having a lost deal. So your job is to balance that. However, always consider building the vision as the like very important phase of, of kicking off a new product. You need to build that, build that vision in the form that almost having two versions of it. One version is something that can be sold for the next five years to the customer. Another version is actually, but this is what actually is happening phase by phase. Monetization. I like to say monetization is real in enterprise. It's one of the few types of businesses that actually know how to monetize because they actually charge customers money, a lot of money, like much more money than actually product costs. Um, the pricing is high, like it can be, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions for a single customer. Um, you cannot indirectly monetize your customer. You cannot look in some area of access to the data, access to the persona and say like, let me actually like uh, sell some of it, you cannot. You know, most likely, even if nobody cares, you still will be told that you cannot sell it. And um, pricing and packaging. I think I briefly uh, touched on that. Pricing and packaging complex. Uh, while I was working at Splunk, and again, I don't know how much you know about Splunk, it's like big data log management uh, platform. Um, we had like two pricing committees every year. It was like people were spending days of time like brainstorming, talking and uh, doing some analysis of the market, of the competition, of the direction where it goes, just to say, this is how much Splunk is going to cost. Still people complain about that it's expensive. Other people say that it's not expensive enough because Splunk will be losing money if they will not do X, Y, and Z. Uh, who knows the right answer? I don't know. Uh, probably everybody is right depends on what angle they are looking at, uh, at the pricing, but there is always something that's going to work for the company in near term and long term. Go ahead. In um, determining the pricing, is it usually value based? Meaning either you're increasing the client's revenue, you're decreasing costs? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, so it's, it is, it, that, that's actually one of the ways to determine it. Then there is a lot, lots of uh, competitive pricing. It's like lots of competitive pricing built just to segment a different group of customers 
whom you deliver a different message, where you go into the perception. So we, we have premium service. We offer you like much better service because we charge you more. And then there are different groups of like what you can upsell or cross sell, right? So with the Splunk at the point when we started to move into the platform approach rather than product, uh, there was very important for us to make the, the, uh, to, to decide on the group of customers who will pay the price we're actually charging, but at the same time open up the opportunity for upsell. Go ahead. Yeah, so the way I, I'm going to talk about this in a sec. So the way how I see product and platform. Product is something that you build that has a price tag on it that customers can use. There are specific use cases. Platform is an enabling tool that actually allows to build the marketplace. So essentially, um, to be successful in the marketplace, to be successful in enterprise software, you need to leverage marketplace. You need to leverage your direct users and you need to leverage your partners or developer ecosystem or anybody who has a specific domain knowledge, vertical knowledge that you can go in but by giving them your platform. And your platform should provide some value out of the box. So they feel that they're not really choosing between like Java or Ruby or C++ to write on. They actually get kind of end-to-end uh, -end product that it's beneficial for them to use to deliver their product to market. Cool. So customer insights. You sell to one customer or you sell to one million of customers. What do you think? Who knows better the situation on the potential customer base? Your message is it's, it's really easy to get lost in the feedback that is provided by a single customer. You have feedback that is coming from different personas, different angles. You feel, you think you're getting different customer feedback, but everybody is thinking from the angle of the single company, single, uh, you know, uh, single approach. With the uh, consumer based product management, you run wherever. Google Analytics again, amplitude or something, you get a lot of data points uh, and you say, okay, I can kind of understand what's happening here. Or you like run the survey monkey for our neighbors at Zora and like you get a lot of feedback. I don't like it, I like it. And you get a much better uh, picture from your customer base. Um, that's really hard to balance in the enterprise product management. That's why you don't always look at your customers, you look at your prospects, or you look at the target group of your customers. Even if they are not your customers, if they are customers of your competitors, you need to find a way to talk to them, to understand the challenges that they are solving without, without giving them an impression that this is like sales pitch or, or, or you get them into the funnel that at the end nobody is going to be happy because all the, uh, you know, like uh, heavy forces of your sales organization is going after a single person who just gave you feedback how they like your product. And I have seen this happening quite a bit. So, uh, there was a nice story, a company was selling us, um, sell selling Splunk a product, and uh, they they reached out to the, uh, the business uh, owner of that specific area, and um, he listened to them, provided some feedback, uh, next day, CEO received a call from the CEO of the company saying that it looks like you're in a sales cycle for our pro for our product. And there was like a huge group of salespeople who came into the office and started to pitch it really hard. So enterprise companies sell very hard to other companies. So you need to shield your people who are helping you with the product from these attacks because they're going to happen. And lots of companies, from my experience, are actually afraid of that. If you are working, if you have a relationship with one partner, you don't really want to give a message that you're considering moving out, especially depends on the type of relationship there. Stakehold ma management. Uh, I think this is mostly aligned with the all other product management, except that you have to over communicate. Organizations are bigger, everybody has their own motivation and their own agenda. You need to align with those agendas because they, they, 
frankly, not too many people in other in other departments will care about what you do unless you touch your pain points, uh, similar pain points with them. You need to align with them and you need to be present. Just giving a communication or like providing enablement process for the um, for the group of um, I don't know, like uh, support group, customer success, or uh, marketing is not good enough because uh, I, I had experience like giving a, a demo on, on one week, on the next week, same people were asking me about how my product works. When I was like, what about the demo that I gave you last week? And they're like, oh, I actually like multitasking. I, I didn't really pay attention. So, and, and this is very extremely common because all the groups in the large orgs, they tend to attend lots of meetings especially from the product organization. This is the new feature. This is new design. This is new approach. This is something new. Like until field will see something tang tangible, they will, will be able to get a feeling that this is they can sell and this is how they can sell it. Nobody will care. Competition, right? Uh, it's quite hard to get hands on with a com competitor's product, especially if this is enterprise product. It's not like you go to the website, oh, let me do a trial with you guys and like play with it. No, you need to talk to like 10 different salespeople and then maybe, maybe they will give you a demo instance, but they will ask you to sign all these kind of forms of non-disclosure and like, you know, like all these contracts and everything. They will do a like background check on you to make sure you're not actually exploring their product because what they say, as I mentioned before, what field may say, can be very different from how product looks like. So uh, it, it's protected very hard, but you still want to know how it's being used. So there are two ways. You're either being a customer of a product before, and now you want to design something similar to that product, or uh, you're actually very smart about how you get access to it. Um, you need to have a good understanding of how market research firms work. Gartner, Forrester, MGI, right? This is the way how you market yourself. This is the way how, this is a very important check, check item on your list of how we position the product, how we can get from one area to another, what, what the message we deliver. Uh, so you really need to get very comfortable with that. Um, and the magic quadrant, I don't know, how many of you have ever heard about that? Got it. So this is, Essentially, there are, I don't remember how many of those, but uh, um, there is a magic quadrant that basically puts your company based on certain criteria, uh, sometimes disclosed, sometimes not disclosed, um, in, in some area of the so-called magic quadrant. You are the leader or uh, a visionary or something in this space. Why that was initially or I guess some years ago, very important because it creates a co common denominator for, for the companies, for the larger enterprises to actually look at this quadrant, pick on the leader and say, okay, we're going to buy from the leader. We're not going to buy from somebody who being identified as like you know, newcomer or slagger uh, on, 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 on that quadrant. The bad thing is like it's, it's, it's a black box. It has underrepresentment of a lot of companies. You don't always know what actually being considered to, to be here or there unless you actually engage into the process. And I can tell you it's expensive to be engaged into this process. And then there is an evil, right? So uh, you don't always go where bias goes towards. So it's uh, I have seen examples of how companies being rated highly because of the investor bias, because of investors think this is a hot thing to do. And... And they, they totally ignore the buyer's aspect of it. Again, sell vision, don't sell your technology. Because when you sell vision very effectively, uh, the first ones to come are investors and then the buyers. Questions so far? No, good. Okay, 10th reason. Again, another pet peeve of mine, tolerance to ambiguity, right? So, um, yeah, there are many ways to think about it. So. I even like found the description. Ambiguity is a doubtfulness and certainty of meaning or intention. Um, I think even Microsoft posted the specific requirements to one of their pr 
pro I think they call program managers, not the product managers, the program manager job that says you have to have a tolerance to ambiguity, you cope with the change, you know how to shift gears, correct course correct, make a decision without having a total picture, handle risk and uncertainty and be comfortable with that. That's good. Makes sense. You're going to deal with it every single day. Why this is bad? Because it's not about tolerance of ambiguity. It's about intent to reduce ambiguity. You want to actually invest your time and efforts to reduce that. You don't want to live in total ambiguity and bad, you know, blind. It's, it's like roulette. You're not in, in Vegas where you need like to throw black or red and hopefully you can win because you don't know all the details, right? Um, and then it's easy to, for you to come in and say, okay, I'm not, I don't have a, to, a, a complete picture. That's why I think what I learn is good enough. How do you know when it's good enough? Do you need to uh, collect 10 responses, 100, 1 million? So what is good enough? There is no clear definition of it. So until you establish it for yourself and prove that this is good enough, this is, this is, this is complete ambiguity. If you know what you think is, is good enough and you can explain, you can prove that you're right, I think this is much more important. Any questions? No? I'm pretty sure everybody dealt with that at some point. No has its price. Uh, I think every time I'm hearing from junior product management uh, question is like the job of the product manager to say no. So always say no. First say no, then say yes. Or actually say no, never say yes. Um, so in the enterprise product management, you need to listen, you need to listen again, you need to understand, you need to know the topic that you're talking about before saying no. Why listen twice? Because sometimes this is important, more often than it's not. Uh, so there is no zero sum ga game. It's not like if I do this, I don't do this. So there's, it's not always the case. So your job is actually make the flow work. You align things and dependencies the way that actually can, then can unblock your customers. But at the same time, you don't do all at the same time. It's hard. It's challenging. You need to have a framework. There are different frameworks for that. So some people build a weighted matrix that is dependent on engineering availability, number of risk and certainties on specific project, and this how this is aligned with the marketing schedule, and you weight every single one, and they say, okay, this is like a, a quantitative approach to that. Some people use their gut feeling, and they say, okay, it looks like this is a lot of requests from this from the field. I, I can deliver this. It's going to... Is it will not move the needle, but it will at least will pave the way, uh, the, the the way to for me to do a major announcement in two years, saying we are doing this right now. So different approaches to that, but again, this is not the zero sum game. So uh, don't 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 do this, and as well as product features, don't tailor them for a specific customer. Listen to one customer, great, they have their own opinion, challenge that opinion. Find a different one. Find a different use case. Don't trust Phil too much. Phil will come to you and say, all I see is these use cases. We have guys who are working specifically on telco deals. They will throw you only telco use cases. And they're going to tell you, there are no more use cases. Telco is the way. They know how to do it because they do it all the time. Then you go into the media companies or like high growth companies. And they will say like, no, we don't even know what you're talking about. Even though you, they do the same thing, that same function, right? Not, not the same for them, not the same product. Um, so as I said, like having some system and being transparent how you made that decision always helps. If somebody pushes you really hard, give, you, give them your uh, you know, spreadsheet with the weight, weighted score on how you made that decision. Say, this is how, how I made my decision. Please challenge it. But please explain why you think that might be wrong. Um, and again, I want to finish it. There is always real price to rejection. So rejection may end a lost deal. Lost deal may, may, may be tracked. And most likely it will be tracked somewhere. And it will be at some point tracked against you as the product organization. So if you are blocking deals 
and you do this systematically, you might not be doing a good job in this. Right? Any questions? Okay. Uh, I wish I can answer you, right? So you're answering the question which I think is a little uh, specific, or maybe you have something specific in mind. So I can't tell you if we should let customers do it. There are lots of signals that actually will allow you to build a big picture. For example, if this is a deal block blocker, if this is a deal blocker, actually, is this the only thing in this deal, or there are other features that are lacking? Because for you to tell them, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to sleep nights and my engineer is going to hate me forever for, for pushing that through. Um, you will do this, but there are other three other components that will not work anyway. So why even bother? Right? So, but again, you cannot go and say no because of these guys. You need to put this into your systematic approach, how you prioritize those requests. Because at the end, you may also end up having this as an escalation. Some organizations are really heavy on that. Some organizations, will, you will receive a sing, a, an email every single week saying, we have an escalation to SVP, we have an escalation to CEO, now please come to the meeting with a, a lot of uh, high-level uh, people who will, say, who will ask you, like, why are you rejecting Toyota? Why are you rejecting some other big customer whom we like being working on the deal for two years? If you can back it up and if you truly believe this is the best for your company and for the product, yes. But as I'm trying to say, you need to have a framework for that. It's really hard to say, I feel that this is the way how it should be. Uh, okay, the life thereafter. So what's typical I'm seeing with happening with the product managers in enterprise? So first, you're exposed to the larger set on inefficiencies in the enterprise companies. It's easy to see how old school products are, how terrible workflows and processes are there. It's often, it's often the reality of the things. Um, so you kind of already prepared for the product that has been validated with the market and you can claim product fit. The problem is it's much harder to enter those markets. Because now, when you think it's time for you to move on, to work with for a different company in more leading role because you acquired some domain knowledge or start something on your own, you're still dealing with the same problems again and again. You need to have a, a, a go good supporting organization like a field, like a marketing, like, uh, like some access to the front line so you can sell the solution to those problems. Um, so it ends up in being more important to build your network rather than actually like uh, the consumer approach. Build something people want and they will go to your website, sign up and we'll use it. Yeah, I have seen that in the consumer space. So my startup got 30,000 signups overnight, actually shut down all the servers. I have seen that. My product didn't work, so uh, that's, that's fine. I, I actually, it was a good sign that service went down. But um, with the enterprise space, it's like you cannot sell from the web page. And if you look at the majority of web pages of the enterprise companies, they barely talk sense. They give you, sell you vision, they sell you industries, they sell you expertise, they don't sell you product a lot, unless you will actually engage into the sales cycle. And hiring bias, I mean, enterprise versus consumer. If you will try to go from the enterprise space to the consumer product management, you will have hard time selling yourself. Different applies is the same way. If you go from the consumer space to the enterprise, most of the things like field enablement, cross-functional works, user experience, and all that stuff, you will have hard time doing this. So. Think twice before you commit your career to like doing something in this space that you don't think you were going to like. If you want to work for a Facebook, 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 not Facebook for business or something like that, maybe uh, don't go into enterprise at all. Um, so 
Go ahead. Can you elaborate on like the trade off between choosing enterprise and consumer? How yeah. Are the courier, how, are, how are the couriers different? And, uh, so, yeah, I, I can't I can't say how career is different. I don't think I have built a career in consumer space, so I can't speak much to it. So, uh, as I said, in my in, in my understanding is consumer space something that is heavy on the user, and I'm going to talk about this in, in a bit, um, just to summarize it all. Um, B2B space is focusing on the shorter sales cycle, maybe not even having a sales org uh, to the businesses, solving business problems, and enterprise, you're solving problems in the enterprise. It means much larger sales cycle, it means much bigger sales organization. So like, it's, it's even like, if you take a step, step back and look how big is your sales org in your company, so the bigger the org, the, the, the longer the sales cycle, the harder to get your customer. So if you come into the company that has like 500 people and 300 of them are salespeople, guess whom we were selling to. <laughs> Does it make some sense? So with the, and again, just wait for the next slide, I guess. Any more questions until I, okay. So let me summarize all that in like three slides. Consumer versus enterprise. In the consumer, you sell to a product by, to a user to be used by a user, right? User buys, users uses, users provides feedback, user is, is your everything. Enterprise, you build a product that will be bought by one person and will be used by another. So you need to sell to both. So there should be something in your product, messaging or the actual functionality that would be appealing to both. You're never gonna see this in the consumer space. Um, so actually, what do you what what do you actually sell? I have seen uh, product managers coming from the consumer space or space with lots of like web assets or you know like digital user experience who are trying to use the same playbook to optimize or to sell. They actually like wasting their cycles because that's not how you work on the customers. So. As I, I think I we, we briefly touch on that. So I believe, truly believe, in enterprise product management, you need to apply the best of your rule of lazy guy, lazy person. You don't build stuff yourself. You enable marketplace. You enable your developer ecosystem to actually come in and build extension to a product. For the enterprise, think of supply chain or think of like, again, with Azora, quoting to revenue. There are so many aspects of it. First is uh, CPQ is like, you know, quoting. There is a product catalog, pricing. There is the way how you rate, how you manage usage. Don't talk about usage because it's whole telco scenario is like mediation, rating, correction, some uh, modification. Then you go into the billing, invoicing. There are a hell of a lot of systems that do only invoicing. And this has to be part of your process because you're providing that process. Then you go into like all this finance part. Then you go into revenue recognition. With a the revenue recognition, there are multiple finance systems that are different ways how you apply it. Again, there are many systems that do only rev rec. So you cannot build it everything yourself if you want to be successful. But you want to own the whole business of the customer, of this enterprise. Otherwise, the companies will say like, you see, somebody comes in and they have a solution for all the phases. They don't care what kind of solution if they're comparing solution or no solution. If, the, if somebody comes in and says like, I have integration with all the leading uh, platforms for taxes, for billing, for something else, of course, this is no brainer. They will pick you rather than just usage mediation product. So if this is this way, you need to go after B2B market. You don't go after enterprises. Make sense? Yeah, so this, this, this may sound a little bad. This may sound a little like high level. The thing is like, this is the reality. You need to start thinking about the ecosystem if you're in enterprise. Who is building it for you? Whom you partner with? Who knows the vertical that you're selling to? Like, you know, again, Splunk initially was selling to, you know, system administrators and DevOps. So they can be a Google for your machine data. You go to the 
Google line, type some stuff, and you find it, everybody is happy. At the end, you want to, to sell it to uh, healthcare. Are you going to build a product for healthcare yourself? No, because you know how to manage the data. Find your partner who will build the healthcare ap application for you, who can then leverage that and bring those customers to your platform. And this is not true for the consumers. With the consumers, you're actually solving a problem or making it more convenient or making it more fun. Or you actually go for a specific need, you solve that, and, and everybody is happy, or most of the people. And again, how you build, uh, you don't get excited with the agile approach in, in enterprise. Why? Because those salespeople who sell something for 12 months long, they will not be excited about your agile approach. Let us keep building those little things and you keep selling. No, they cannot do this. They, they, they get trained, then they send into the field, and all they care is about what they can sell. Nobody will keep up with all these little updates that you can deliver. That's why it's like agile process is great for engineering teams. They can run their scrums, kanbans, or whatnot, some iterative development. But your job as a product manager to understand when is it, it is time to deliver message internally, when it goes externally. You cannot be like super agile company in all ways. So what applies to engineering does not apply to product manager. And uh, so most of the time it works like hybrid approach. Uh, what does it mean is basically you always communicate long-term and vision to the field. They will know how, you know, like understand your message. They will know how to wrap your message into the sales pitch. But at the same time, give them the plan. This is what's happening today, tomorrow, the day after tomorrow. And most of them will be fine with that. Don't bother them with the, with the regular updates. We delivered that feature. We're not delivering this feature. It's, it's, again, they have their own job, and their job is more important for them than yours. So, go ahead. Mm -hmm. and the sales team is going and selling it today. How do they demo that to their customers? Like, to, since like, so I work for a startup in the background, yeah. and not a lot of people believe that this company can actually succeed, but like your product is good. So if I'm giving my sales team the vision that they need to sell for six months down the line, how do they demo the product if it's yeah. not like market validation? Great question. I call it vaporware. You, you fake it, you fake it, you show it, and if it works, it works. If not, just, you know, scratch it, move on. You, you, you're gonna pay for that later. Yes. Yeah, uh, uh, for, for reals, for reals. So like, if you embed that into the culture, and I have seen that, I cannot name the names of the companies, I have seen them doing this for three years in a row on the pretty, large conferences, vaporware was shown for the same feature in three different versions because they were losing or forgetting that what, which version was shown and they did course correction, they rebuilt it, again, couldn't deliver on time, decided to announce three times, three years. Um, they ended up being punished very, really hard for that because first, field started to think that every, any feature can be faked and shown. Second, if they sell it to somebody and the sales cycle is not as long as you think, then they come into you and say like, um, uh, where is the feature, please? Mm -hmm. So I, 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 I believe that it's totally fine to, not to fake, sell your vision with the visuals um, at the early stages but you should be extremely careful about that. If this is a product, a product market validation with the, with the startup, that's fine. If you're talking about the company that think it hit or the product market fit and you are just delivering new features, uh, there should be a different way to do it. You don't, don't give it to sales. And because, yeah, they will not blaming you for that. 
Anything else? No, good. So, quick, finishing, wrapping up. So what did you learn today? Acknowledge difference. I hope you can acknowledge difference between what I have just described with something you probably heard or may hear in future. Their enterprise product management was quite a bit of surprise to me. I, I think I never told the story how I actually ended up being there. Um, I've been working for a smaller startup in B2B space and um, got an offer from Splunk. And I was like, on-prem software, like really something you ship on the CDs and like sell to people, send mail and like install and like all that stuff. And it's like 2010 right now. It was like, who does it? I reject it, right? And uh, the, the, the fun thing that I met with one of the co-founders and he actually explained what he's trying to achieve and what he's trying to do. And his vision was great. I said, I want to go after it. And the first six months in the job was the most painful period for me. I had no idea that I have to engage with so many, as I thought, useless orgs, useless teams uh, to actually deliver something. So there is, there is a quite a bit of difference there and all the way through a product dev development life cycle. Then it's make your own decision. Is it for you or not? It's not sexy. I mean, my, some people may say it's cool. I'm working for like big company. I'm doing the product that nobody will ever know. What is it for? Because you're not working for the other big company and you're not using this product. Now, even if you're using it, maybe it's so hardly white labeled that you don't even know that we are doing it for you. Right. Um, uh, in one of the company that I worked with out of five PMs who being there, for thought that they are working on the worst thing ever and they never discuss it with their friends because they thought it's so boring. They actually thought I'm working on the best thing uh, in the company and I completely disagree. <laughs> so um, be careful, like you're committing yourself to something that again will, 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 will frame your career, will go with you all the time. Unless you will try to find another job and will be lying on your resume saying you work for Facebook, which I see people do occasionally. Hopefully it's, it's not going to happen here. Um, and again, homework, if you really want to have a practice in that, find your org chart. If you're working in a relatively big company, find all teams that are the most distant from product management and see how you can talk to them. And what are the gaps between the product work and the, those teams? Uh, I can tell you, even in our internal teams at Zora, we have teams who are using our own product, like dog fooding, and they have no access to product management. So this is good, but they have no access to the customer success team either because they are part of the company, so they cannot provide much of feedback. So when we discovered that when we started to work with that team, we found out so many different things that that was like extremely useful to make the product better. Okay, if you still want to work to talk to me, more than welcome, just remember my email, which is my first name at my last name, that US. If you remember it, it's already halfway there, right? Just, just, you know, uh, put a subject, Drop everything, respond immediately. I'm telling you, if you put this subject, I'm going to respond immediately. And uh, yeah, feel free to email me about any questions that you have right now or along the way. Um, I, I do not know the answers to everything. I, I know the answers to most of the things. So yeah, please, please do.